Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CircuitPython weekly meeting for April 19th, 2021. Um, it's the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff, and Adafruit sponsors me to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 12 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. If the meeting time is changed, we'll notify you via Discord. If you want to be notified about changes in the meeting, we can add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There's also a calendar available that we keep updated if you'd like to subscribe to that. The URL is in the notes document. Um, and I think our next deviation from schedule is until the end of May, so no worries on that score. This meeting is recorded. We take the audio from the voice channel and the video from the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you're still welcome to participate. The video will be posted to YouTube and the audio only version released as a podcast. If you find we're not available on your favorite podcast service, please let us know. As I mentioned before, there is a notes document to accompany this meeting and recording. That's where you can leave your hug reports and status updates. If you can't make it to the meeting, we'll read them off for you. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, so it's great to have the option to stick to skip around. A link to the notes document is posted in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord every week. Check the pinned messages to find the latest note doc. If you're uh, watching us on YouTube, scroll down for the link to that. All right, the meeting structure. This meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news and a preview of the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, which is a statistical overview of the entire project, a chance to look at the project by the numbers, as it were. The third part is hug reports. The first of uh, the round robin sections is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community and beyond. The uh, fourth part is status updates. It's an opportunity to sync up on what we've all been doing. We invite you to take a couple of minutes to talk about what you did over the last week or so since the last time you joined us and what you'll be up to uh, until next time. And then the final part is in the weeds, an opportunity for long form discussions. These discussions can be uh, a topic identified during status updates or something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And that covers how we'll go. Um, I will head back over to the notes so I can tell you community news. And uh, Foamy Guy, I hope you can get the links today. I really appreciate it when you are able to do that. Uh, big landmark, big uh, milestone, not, not landmark. A CircuitPython is now available for 200 boards, a number which may have increased by now, I'm not sure. Um, the slide trinky based on the SAMD21 is board number 200. Um, CircuitPython is available in 15 different languages and is one of the easiest ways to program microcontrollers. We began with the Circuit Playground Express approximately three years ago and reached 100 boards in January 2020 with the Open Hardware Summit badge. Now a year later, we've reached 200 boards. Chips in supported include Espressive, Microchip SAMDs, Nordic, NXP, RP2040s, ST, and more. A big thank you to everyone in our community who has submitted boards to CircuitPython. And uh, there's blog link, circuitpython.org website, all sorts of good stuff. Um, speaking of good stuff, Scott's presentation from the Open Hardware Summit 2021 is now on YouTube. Uh, the title, I think, is Interface Design in Open Source Hardware and Software. I need to watch that one myself, and I've got time uh, tomorrow that I'm planning to do that. You can also check out the whole Open Hardware Summit broadcast on YouTube. Next up, we've got projects. The River Prairie Troll Project uses CircuitPython, among other things, to create an interactive art installation. The uh, 
Pico 8 encoders LOL. You can hook up eight rotary encoders with switches to a Raspberry Pi Pico without any extra hardware, and it's all supported by CircuitPython. Next up, Plan CO2, making a public display of CO2 levels from MakeZine. And uh, last up, enhancing the Pimeroni EnviroPlus Featherwing Plotter to plot CO2 parts per million from the Adafruit SCD30 NDIR sensor, and that is a link on YouTube. And I'm not sure who's be behind that one, but uh, check out that link for sure. The CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter is a community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are on adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. Um, so because this is a community-run newsletter, we invite you to contribute your own news or project. You can edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request with the changes. You can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. Add your own project, your friend's project, your dog's project. We want uh, everything and anything. And with that, I will move on to the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Just a reminder that uh, two or three weeks ago, we had a fix to our statistics, and hopefully now we are not missing some of those authors, particularly on pull request activity. This week, we are reporting 54 pull requests merged from 30 authors and 14 reviewers. And issues-wise, we had 22 closed issues by 13 people and 27 open by 23 people. So, I mean, first, it's really exciting that we, um, of course, authors, reviewers, and people active on issues overlap. But, you know, we're getting well into that three dozen people active weekly to help us improve CircuitPython, and that is just really awe-inspiring. Um, some new names among the authors that I don't recognize are Mick Glenn, Stone Hippo, David Lee Dom, D. Jekin, and Scott Monahan. Some of those may have appeared before, but they're less familiar to me, but we appreciate every one of you. And as to the reviewers, it's your review that uh, makes things go smoothly and lets us merge in uh, high quality pull requests. And yeah, we, we need, all sides to keep things going. And with that, I will pass things on to Scott to tell us about the core. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. Sorry, I was too busy rolling my eyes at a post on the Raspberry Pi forums. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so for the core, we had 18 pull requests merged from 17 different authors. So thank you to all of the our authors. Um, so new names I just wanna say thank you to are Stone Hippo, uh, Zodius Infuser. Uh, wow, so many of these names I do recognize. So thank you to those folks. Uh, thank you to the four reviewers. And uh, also thank you to Naradoc for getting this list fixed up last week uh, again. Uh, we have 25 open poll requests. A couple of those are quite old. Um, so again, as always, please take a look at those. Um, uh, if you could pick, if folks need something to help out with uh, or want to help out with something, picking up old pull requests is very, very helpful. Um, there's good stuff in these pull requests, and it's it's sad to see them not get fully merged in. Uh, Issues-wise, we had seven closed issues by five people and 12 open by 10 people, so we're not up, uh, for a total of 427 open issues, which you can see at github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython slash issues. Uh, we have five active milestones. Um, and two issues not assigned to milestone. So that's how we triage issues. So we're generally on top of things. Uh, and we'll take a look at that uh, later. We have 56 open issues for 7.0. So we're going to have to uh, take a, a hard look at that list over the next few weeks slash month or two uh, as we work on the 7.0 stable release. Um, overall, I'd say core work is going well. 6.2 has been stable and 7x is well underway. Um, now is kind of the time before we do any 7.0 releases for us to change stuff. So expect to see some some bigger changes happening before we get to that first alpha or beta. Uh, we hit 200 boards and continue to add more. So we may also want to consider a 6.2.1 backport of the new board desk uh, if the 7.0 unstable pre-release will be either quite unstable or um, oh, a long ways away. So we may want to do that too. Uh, anyway, really good. Uh, so thanks. 
Yeah, I think that's really a great idea because we do have a bunch of exciting boards coming out and typically it's a pretty easy process that just involves copying a couple of files um, mm -hmm. from the main branch into the 6.2 branch. So if that sounds like something that you would be up for, uh, let one of us know and we'll show you how to do that. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm kicking myself that we didn't do those on the 6.2 branch actually because if we did them on the 6.2 branch, we could merge the 6.2 branch back into the main one going the opposite direction is it's not really feasible mm -hmm. so we'll end up having like two sets of commits for each thing yeah but that's no big deal. deal commits are free they're just numbers well 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 said <laughs> well, I, i've been on the receiving end of a similar sentiment mm. or I've, I've dished out a similar sentiment yeah before. well anyway um next we'll pass things to katni to tell us about the libraries thanks jeff so this section is about uh, all of the CircuitPython libraries, including uh, the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, um, a couple of extras like Cookie Cutter, um, and also including the community bundle. Um, so we had across all of that, 35 pull requests merged from 16 authors and 14 reviewers. And I want to point out two review names that one of one of them is uh, J. Edgar Park, who uh, works with Adafruit, but has not popped up on our review list previously very often. And the real Fenrir is new as a reviewer as well. Um, and Kmatch98, uh, I haven't seen very often as a reviewer. And so I wanted to specifically um, thank those folks because um, like we keep saying, reviewing keeps the process moving um and it's not um it's one of those things where you know we we want to see new people get into it and so i wanted to thank specifically our reviewers um versus where we usually are thanking our authors um leaving us with 53 open pull requests uh we had 13 closed issues by 11 people and 12 open by 12 people leaving us with 330 open issues. You can find all this information and more at circuitpython.org slash contributing. And if you're looking to contribute to CircuitPython on the uh, Python side of things, um, contributing to the libraries is a great way to start. You can check out the open pull requests and see if anything, um, you, you can start reviewing there and see, just make a comment um, if you check out syntax or you find a typo, or if you have the hardware, test the PR. Um, and leave a comment that you did that. And that's usually how we suggest to get start reviewing the libraries is to just um, do that sort of thing and leave a comment. And then eventually we can level you up to actually joining our um, review team. Uh, there's also a list of open issues, which you can search uh, by label. Good first issue is a great place to start if you're new to contributing overall. And if you're looking for something a little more complicated, bug or enhancement is an excellent search uh, label. We have a guide on contributing to Git and GitHub, uh, or contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. So if you're new to all of that, don't let that intimidate you. And we're always available on Discord to answer questions. We want you to be able to contribute in a way that works for you, and we are happy to help make that happen. Uh, there were no new libraries in the last seven days, and um, we had a number of updated libraries, which I will not read off overall, although I will point out we have had more updates to the community bundle. Um, overall, I'm still super pleased to see older PRs being picked up. We had one that was 265 days old that got merged. Um, as well, I'm very excited about all of the updates being made to the libraries through new PRs. Early hug report to everyone who is submitting PRs to the libraries. As always, if you're waiting for us on something in a current PR, uh, please ping us and we'll try to circle back to it as soon as possible. Um, otherwise, it's worth looking at some of these older PRs and deciding what we want to do with them. Um, but for example, the absolute oldest PR is still active. So um, the ones uh, between that and the new ones, um, it may be worth taking a look at them and see whether um, the original author is still interested in merging it, see whether it can be picked up. Um, and as Scott says about the core, um, in terms of the Python side of things, that is an excellent way to help as well is to pick up an older PR and get it ready to go with the newer code. And that's where we are at the libraries. Thank you, Katni. And with that, um, it's time for Melissa to give us the Blinka stats. 
Hello. Uh, for Blinka, we, we had uh, this week we had one poll request merged by one author and one reviewer. Uh, there are seven open poll requests at the moment, and that's between all the different Blinka related repos. Uh, there were two closed issues by two people and three open by three people, leaving a net of 57 open issues. There were 6,803 PyPI downloads in the last week, and we are currently supporting 72 boards. Overall, uh, there hasn't been much uh, movement on the Blinka side, but uh, I'd love to see more um, contributors. Well, I do feel like uh, the number of weekly downloads uh, kind of inches up, so it's good to see that happening. I see it all over the place, to be honest. Is it? Okay. I, I was thinking, oh, I feel like, you know, it used to be 2,000, and maybe it's just super high this week or something. But Well, yeah, it is uh, pretty high this week, actually. I mean, I've seen it down in the hundreds, too, uh -huh. so I'm not sure what affects it. Yeah, probably how much CI we're doing, because those will each download Blinka, right? Yeah. Oh, anyway. <laughs> all right. It's time to move on um, to Hug Reports. As an element of positivity in the world, we like to say thank you to one another for uh, good stuff that we're doing, um, or good stuff that they are doing. So to show you how it's done, I will begin, and then I will pass it to Jerry and on down the alphabet. So first, a hug report uh, to Dan for briefly being a sounding board about a problem I was having on the SAMD51, although I was asking the wrong question. Another hug to Paint Your Dragon, Phil B, for excellent code to study for the OB77, the OB7670 camera and SAMD51's parallel capture interface. Um, on a more personal note, GitHub users uh, Joe Callier and Howoff for recently contributing to a desktop Python project of mine. To Ask Patrick W for updating Circup so that it works with 7.x, although you do have to install the version from Git for now. And a preemptive hug release, hug release, hug report. Um, I'm going to be working on my first um, Adafruit bundle circuit Python library this week, and I know I will be asking for help to get that ready. Um, so thanks to whoever's going to help me out on that. Uh, with that, I will pass it to Jerry and then um, read notes from Jose David. Oh, uh, thanks. So just a uh, yeah, hug to KMatch for the uh, memory guide. Nice to be done. And, uh, and a group hug to everybody. All right. Um, so next up after Jose David's notes is Katni. But uh, Jose David writes a hug to KMatch for the second contribution to my Aero library, as well as the new memory saving learning guide. And a hug to Anic Data for testing my silly solution. Uh, next up, Katni, and after that, K-Match. All right, so first up, I have two hugs for Naradoc. The first one for manually updating the back end of circuitpython.org slash downloads to remove the 6.2.0 release candidate link that was still available, and for, making, for updating the script that generates all of that to make sure that that doesn't happen again in the future. Um, as it stood, when we made a stable release, if there was no higher numbered unstable release, it would continue to show on circuitpython.org the previous unstable release as the, you know, latest unstable release. And that was obviously confusing. Um, and so Naradoc updated the script that generates all of that so that in the future that won't happen. However, the site was already generated with 6.2.0 release candidate zero or release candidate one or whatever it was. Um, and so there was, uh, I believe a JSON file that needed to have a reference. Made. To... Yes. And, um, I was talking with our internal person, Justin about it. And Justin's like, I, I don't even, I've never edited the file. Like this, this seems crazy. And Naradoc's like, I have a PR for you. And <laughs> so that was perfect. Um, it was amazing. Thank you so much for doing that. We could have waited until we had another unstable release and then just dealt with it in the future, but that's now taken care of. And so the huge, huge, huge hug report for that. Um, as well, a hug report to Naradoc for getting the module filtering or for getting module filtering going on the board support matrix. Um, 
to Jose David for the flurry of documentation updates, to K Match for his first guide, which was on CircuitPython memory, uh, to everyone who helped us get to 200 boards on CircuitPython.org, and um, unrelated to CircuitPython, a hug report to the Ingenuity team at NASA for a successful first flight on Mars. All right. Um, yeah, I haven't gone reading the news coverage of the test of the flight because I know I just fall in and not come out all day. So after after I'm done for the day. All right. Um, K match is next, and then Maker Melissa. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So first off, thanks to Jose David for the arrow library, uh, which is an easy way of drawing uh, arrows pointing at things. Uh, and uh, I guess I'd like to amplify all the hugs I received on the Learn Guide and pass some of my own out. First to Katni and Justin for help in figuring out how to write a Learn Guide and to give me some pointers and uh, fixes to get that get that done. And also a big thanks to everybody who contributed some ideas to, to go into that. Uh, specifically, I'll call it David Glauda, Indico, and the Purple Samurai. And there was a community member that made a comment uh, I don't know how to figure out who they were, but uh, thanks for that one, particularly related about SAMD21 boards, which got incorporated yesterday. Uh, and then the uh, the system for making the guides is really uh, easy to use, so thanks to everybody who who designed that. So I'm sure a ton of work that went in to, to making that so so easy to operate and for, for me to figure out. Uh, and last off, uh, for to Foamy Guy for taking the big first step of initiating the move of all the display O. Uh, library, specifically the widgets, into the new GitHub CircuitPython organization. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. And yeah, congratulations on that first learn guide. I haven't actually read it yet. Um, all right, next up is Maker Melissa, and then um, Mark, if uh, he's here to read his notes. Uh could you come back to me? I seem to have lost the guy or oh. the document. Yeah, that's fine. Mark, are you ready to go or do you want me to read them? All right, I can read Mark, who just has a group hug. And um, Melissa, did you find your place? I did. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, so this, uh, I want to give a hug report to uh, Katni for starting the Funhouse product guide. A uh, hug report to Dan Halbert for contributing to Blinka and uh, Noe for uh, adding the uh, Feather RP2040 to the Matrix Portal Library and a group hug to everyone else. All right. Scott, you are up next without adequate notice. And then after that, I have notes from Anic Data. I got you. Uh, hug report again to KMatch for the memory saving guide. A uh, hug report to AJS256, who suggested a fix on one of my PRs that had failed CI. It's always nice to see that folks are looking at what I'm doing, and it, it's extra helpful to suggest a fix, so thank you. And then a uh, hug report to Tiomich for the QString space-saving PR. Uh, that was really neat, uh, so thanks to them. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, I have notes from Anecdata, and then it's off to Ask Patrick. So Anecdata has a hug for Naradoc for testing a small PR I didn't have the board for. Uh, after Patrick is Dan. But go ahead, Patrick, if you're here. You are not. All right. Uh, Patrick has a hug report for Jim Bennett for his help on the Azure IoT library. It's always great to see Microsoft contributing. All right. Dan is up, and then I have notes from David. So thanks to Jose David for... Um tackling a number of libraries and adding uh, better simple example documentation and also fixing a bunch of other things uh, in, about the documentation in a number of those libraries. And thanks to Naradoc for the sort of Python.org improvements that we talked about already and also for the, um, uh, the read the docs dynamic filtering by existing by uh, existing modules in any particular board you can say which boards have such and such a module and it'll it'll narrow it down it's wonderful all right after the notes from david it will be foamy guy but uh first david has a hug for bill binko known as at makers bill for progressing on the ble hid to multiple hosts to chris young and bill bingo for the cutie pie hat and the iot ir learn guide 
a hug to Kmatch for the Memory Saving Learn Guide and Fixing Bitmap Saver. And last, a hug to Kevin J. Walters for more contribution to the EnviroPlus Featherwing and the addition of the CO2 data from Sensirion, the SCD30. I'm going to hand it to Foamy Guy, and then after that is Hierofact. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, first up, hug to Kmatch for the memory uh, saving guide. Um, really nice tips in there for uh, measuring and saving memory. Um, to Le Samurai Porpe for help with some Sphinx syntax that I was fighting during the uh, the stream over the weekend, and uh, probably some other folks, unfortunately, that I may have forgotten who helped me out during that stream. Uh, I appreciate all of you. To uh, Hugo for working on the vertical progress bar and refactoring, a big refactor in the progress bar library. Um, and then lastly, to Jerry N, who has continued to dig into a weird issue with the, I think this is the right one, SMTP S10 uh, touchscreen driver that does some weird stuff when the device resets. Jerry has narrowed that down uh, quite a bit to figure out a, a reliable way to repeat the, the issue. So um, thank you for that. And that's all for me. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Next is Hair Effect, and then Hugo gets to wrap it up today. Alrighty. Um, just a thank you to Dan for his continued help on the deep sleep stuff, and a group hug to everyone else. All right. Hugo, take it away. All right. First of all, a hug to Jose David for walking me through how to create a pull request or actually getting reviews on a pull request, reviewers on a pull request, uh, to KMatch and Foam Guy for their testing of the progress bar over time uh, as I've worked on it and updated the pull request, and then group hugs. All right, thank you. Next up is status updates, the time for you to let us know about what you've been working on recently and what you plan to be working on in the near future. It's a round robin, the same as Hug Reports, and I will start it off. So last week, I spent a pretty good chunk of time on the I2S out on the IMX RT 10XX series, but I never had any success in getting um, the waveforms to come out. So I'm setting that aside for a bit. And instead, I started on support for OB7670, which is a a digital camera and the parallel capture device of the SAMD51 microcontroller. And I've already been able to capture an image with CircuitPython and display it with DisplayIO, which is pretty good progress. Um, so this week, there were some things in the I2S out branch that I should separate out and PR in their own right. Uh, I don't remember exactly what those were, but uh, I don't want them to get lost forever. I am going to polish the CircuitPython library for configuring the OV7670 camera and also get this core module um, ready for inclusion. You need both halves before you can use the camera itself. Um, and then I had written, um, well, anyway, I need to change this next item. And um, I also implemented a new kind of color conversion for display io so that if the format of a bitmap in memory is rgb565 rgb555 or either of those with the two bytes swapped that uh, the color converter object can fix that for you and display your bitmap uh, that will go in and be pr'd with the rest of the stuff for supporting cameras um, if I get beyond all of that, the next task is to work on support for a different digital camera module, um, actually one from ESP, but we're still going to uh, be testing it on the Grand Central. So getting a second uh, camera module to work is next up after all those items. Uh, my second COVID vaccination is later today, and so my activity this week may be reduced if I have uh, side effects from that. All right. Jerry is up next, and then I will read the notes from Jose David. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so yeah, so I've been spent a lot of time this week playing with this STMP 610 issue, and it's I'm really baffled by it, but making some some progress, learning a lot anyway. And um, so the you know the basic issue is that and. It, it only happens on the RP2040. In fact, I've only been testing it with the Feather RP2040, but I suspect it's common to RP2040s. 
And if you're using display I.O. as well, so if you have a touch screen, like I've been working with the 2.4 inch uh, Featherwing TFT, there's a funny issue that if you, when you power up and you run something, the little, the little test program I'm running, it comes up fine on power up or a hard reset. But if you do a um, soft reset after that, every other time it will fail. It'll, it'll say that it, it can't detect the board because it, it can't read the version ID. But then if you just do another control D, another soft reboot, it detects it fine. And then it alternates every other time. And I'm just not making any progress in understanding why that would be. Um, so Is there, I, I, I'm, yeah. It, when you start the driver, does it do a reset? Is it possible there needs to be a wait while it resets before you try to read the version ID? Well, I, I've tried putting, it, it does do a reset. Well, actually, it doesn't do a reset until after it's determined the version ID. Hmm. Okay. Um, so it actually does one later. And I've tried adding delays in. And and so I'm, I'm thinking this is a circuit Python issue and not a driver issue is, is where I'm headed. Hmm. And so I'm, I'm tempted if it's if there's no objection to opening an issue referencing this ongoing issue in, in circuit Python. Mm -hmm. And my reason for thinking it's circuit Python related is a that it only happens on the RP2040. And right. if I and it has something to do with display IO. If I if I run just the simple test for the STMPE, it works, that works fine. And the SCMP 610 is a, is a weird board because it has this very strange way of, of determining which uh, SPI mode to be in. And actually, I have two different two different. I have a, a, a keyboard feather wing, and it comes up in mode zero, where the TFT feather wing comes up in mode one. And I think I maybe understand why, but I'm not convinced. But it, it's 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 always been that way in that driver, and there's some notes about it. It's the same way in the Arduino driver that you really can't be sure whether you're gonna, which mode you're going to get. Um, but the key is if I if I if I release the displays manually at the REPL before doing a Control D, everything works fine every time. There's no no alternate. It, it'll always work fine. But the code that runs the code.py, the first thing it does is release the displays. So I don't I don't understand that at all. <laughs> um, so I've got to probably far too much detail for a status report. But so there's an issue out there. Um, again, if there's I guess what I wanted to check was do you have any objection to my moving this to a circuit Python issue? No objective for me. It makes sense. Okay, I'll, I'll do that sometime in the next day or two. Just to and, and again, I'm trying to narrow it down. Sure. Um, and then I'll, yeah, I've been I've been using the logic analyzer and all that stuff, but it all it does is confirms that it, it reads the wrong values and it it it's it, again there's there's something going on there. It's reading the information is there. It's just getting things out of order. It looks like or getting an extra reading in the way. So something's just very funny in the SPI configuration. Sure. So fun stuff was though. I don't know if any others got a chance to watch it this morning, but the. Uh, the first flight of Ingenuity was really pretty impressive. Uh, the helicopter on Mars. Um, it was really fun to be able to watch that, that broadcast and watching all these very young engineers get so excited when this very simple little line plot appeared on their screens. <laughs> it showed the altitude of the helicopter. But it was it was kind of fun to watch this, you know, really something that could have been created by by Mew <laughs> was, was the defining moment of the morning. Uh, really fun to watch. That's it. All right. Well, now I need to know how they measure uh, altitude on Mars. Do you know? Is it barometric pressure, like the kind of sensors that we have from Adafruit, or some other technology? I I, I don't know how they did it. Um, again, given the very low pressure, I, you know, I don't think it was a, a BME 680. But <laughs> no, I suppose they you know, could I I don't know. Um, that's a good question or something. Yeah, it would be interesting I don't know to know. Doing... Yeah. All right, well, we'd better move on. Um, as interesting as Ingenuity is, um, I have notes from Jose David, and then I will pass it to Katni. So finish up your notes, Katni. Okay, Jose David writes that this week, libraries documentation and the Earth and Moon animation in CircuitPython Vectorio. And next week, library documentation and an analog clock on CircuitPython. After Katni, I will pass things to Kmatch.
My notes have been done for a bit. Oh, it looked like somebody was typing in there. Nope. Okay. Um, so published another new, let's see, last week published another newsletter. I wrote a readme for the new uh, Learn System project bundle, explaining quickly how to use the project bundle. Um, and then uh, passed it on to Justin to make sure that it includes a link to the guide that it was downloaded from and the date. So when you click that download project bundle button above the code in a in a project guide, a circuit Python project guide, um, it will include a readme with a quick explanation of what's going on there um, and a link to where it was downloaded from so you don't um, lose uh so you don't you don't lose what you were working on um because it will be named code.py um and not you know ledsnowboard.py anymore so you would want to know where you grabbed it from without checking the code um i published the neo trinky guide which includes templates finally um i say finally because i've been writing these templates for weeks and haven't actually made any of them live this is an example of a uh, uh, NeoPixel link is a, is a template. Um, it shouldn't, it doesn't look any different than any other learn page. Um, but all I had to do is add two things to it instead of having to type all of that out or copy and paste all of that into the guide. So that's, that's exciting for me. Um, <laughs> I updated the HCU 21 F and SHC 31 D guides for the STEM QT revisions. And I started the Funhouse guide. So this week, another newsletter, I need to blog those two guide updates. Um, I'm looking into getting an aggregated list of all the CircuitPython libraries, including the Adafruit and Community Bundles. I will be talking to Jose David about this on Tuesday um, because apparently some work has already been done with that. Um, we're going to have it live on the CircuitPython org on GitHub. Um, and uh, that's going to be convenient for me because we add that number to the newsletter every week. I have the number to the newsletter every week and I manually come up with it by counting um, the number of submodules in the community bundle and adding it to the number that we have on the list for the uh, Adafruit bundle, um, which is goofy because if we're counting all of them, we should really aggregate all of them. So uh, I'm going to be looking into getting that going. Um, then working on the QtPyRP RP2040 guide and then working on templates that are specific to QtPy RP2040 and ostensibly VM0 as well, um, so that I can get them into that guide. Um, and I will also be creating a template for installing CircuitPython onto RP2040 boards, because there's very little difference between the boards. Um, so that'll be convenient too, because every time we create a new RP2040 board, we just put this template page in there and you don't have to worry about um, pasting all the same stuff in repeatedly, which is what we do right now. So that's where I'm at. All right. Thank you. Uh, Carter says, I think the altitude is via LIDAR. So anyway, uh, we have Kmatch and then maker Melissa. So go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. So last week I added to the display IO animation library to added some color morphing uh, functions in addition to the translation functions that were, that were already in there. Uh, and I use that uh, as part of the new learn guide, which has been mentioned above, but there's a link there if anybody wants to take a look. Uh, this week, uh, I want to try out the new CircuitPython graphics org and push the uh, animation repo up there, see if I can figure out how to do that. Um, next, I want to review the slider widget from Jose David, which looks really cool, and it uses a new feature to be added to widgets, basically being able to slide your finger around while it's touched. So I'll get to try that out. Uh, and then the next thing, something I've been trying to avoid so I can get other stuff done, but I think it's uh, been sitting on my desk too long now. I've got a Teensy 4.1, so I want to see how that behaves on CircuitPython since it should be super, super duper fast. So I'm eager to try that. Uh, and I don't think I can hold off anymore. Uh, and then last, uh, main thing I've been working on is in C with the uh, uh, logic analyzer project to see if we can get uh, good uh, 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 integration between SIGROC, which has a viewer for logic signals, along with uh, Adafruit boards. So that's where I'm spending most of my time this week. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, next, we have Maker Melissa, and then I will read Mark's notes unless he lets me know otherwise. Go ahead, Melissa. 
Hello. Uh, last week, I almost finished the Funhouse and Home Assistant Guide, but needed uh, some product guide pages. Uh, so I worked on the fu uh, Funhouse product guide. Uh, during that, I learned about making templates and template pages in the Adafruit Learn Guides, like Kit and he was explaining. And uh, I added a few more boards to circuitpython.org, so that brought us up to 200. Uh, this week, I'm going to uh, finish up both those guides and play catch up on some GitHub issues, and then uh, possibly get back to updating the VS Code extension. And that's it. All right. Um, after I read Mark's notes, we will go to Tanud. Uh, but Mark says, I need to look at issues slash PRs for something else to work on. Suggestions welcome. And getting the vaccine Wednesday. And after Scott, I think I have notes from uh, Anecdata, but I'm not sure. No, nope. after Scott, it'll be Dan. Hello. I finished the demo code for the BLE file transfer protocol. It added offsets and padded values so that they align. Um, I got that working, but the PR itself is still failing CI, so I've got to take a look at that. Um, I also found a bug with struct in the core that I've got to fix. Um, and again, I have PR, but it's failing as well. So I've got to get that in. And that's a that struct packing fix is a prerequisite for that BLE stuff. So uh, that that's top of my list today. Um, I enhanced the GitHub actions for libraries in the core to better highlight errors and help solve them. I think maybe I talked about that last week. Uh, Dylan's coming and going, so I'm not exactly sure when that will roll out, but it's not super urgent. Um, so Dylan will do that when he has time. Uh, last Friday, I started a status LED change, and we'll finish it uh, at the start of this week as well. Uh, we're very much in this mode that doesn't come up very often where we're between major versions. Um, like we've finished 6.2, and we're kind of sticking there, but the next thing we're going to do is a 7.0. Um, so this doesn't come up very often. So status LEG changes is one thing I want to do. Um, we basically want to hit all of the breaking stuff really early so people can, uh, so we can do it early and make sure it's all stable. And in that regard, I was planning on doing the, moving the BLE file transfer stuff into the core, but I'm actually uh, prioritizing merging in MicroPython 115, which was released in the last few days. Um, because we're in this like rare window of moving between versions. So uh, that will mean that the MPY version will change. So heads up, uh, early heads up for that. But um, I'm going to take a week and see how far I get, hoping hoping to get far enough that, it, that it'll be worth it to finish the merge. So uh, thanks to MicroDev for doing that prerequisite work as well. All right. Thank you, Scott. Heading back up to the top of the list, it is Dan. And then after that, I will read notes from David. Okay, so I've been working, uh, continuing working on dynamic USB descriptors. Um, I think I'm, I'm not sure if I said last week, but the API is uh, largely designed and documented. And I was working, we currently have a, some Python code that generates the descriptors, and I was changing it so it would output more information so I could change things at runtime. But it's just kind of getting out of hand. It's 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 there's a it's a very general approach and we don't really need it because each different kind of descriptor except for HID descriptors is different and involves different fix ups and is composed in a different way. So I was starting to make the script output a bunch of stuff that I would use later in the C code and I think I'm just going to take our existing descriptors in their hex format form and just write a little bit of custom code for each one. And I think it'll end up being smaller, which is important because we want to get this to fit on the smallest boards. And then the other thing that's happened is that, as has been true for several months now, we have so many contributions from the country, from the community, that there's just a ton of reviews to do and that occupies uh, time, but it's really good because it produces uh, a new code that's, that's featureful and everything like that. Okay. All right. Uh, after I read David's notes, Foamy Guy will be up next. Uh, so David says, I gave my CPX to a friend after showing off all my gear and telling him about CircuitPython. 
and made a list of advice and learn guide links to get him started with the CircuitPython Express and CircuitPython, and a discussion with Bill Binko on his multi-BLE keyboard project. David, I hope you'll share your uh, list of learn guide links because because um, that would be great. It's good to see what other people prioritize and have found most helpful. Um, so I'll pass it to Foamy Guy, and then after that, Hire Effect. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, last week was testing out the new uh, progress bar style, vertical progress bars, as well as uh, the new examples that are in that repo. Um, and then I started creating the new repositories for the display widgets in the CircuitPython org. Um, and I, I probably am forgetting a few things for last week. I didn't fill it out as I went. Um, so that's all I got there for next week, though. Um, I'll keep going with those new widget repos, and I'm going to try to look into PyPy and read the docs, getting those set up. I have a, a topic down in the weeds to discuss that a little more. Um, I'm going to update some, well, pretty much anything in the learn guide repo that uses progress bar so that it can get the new uh, importing syntax so that we'll be ready to merge that progress bar um, update. Um, I'm going to look into a change that somebody, a, a user of the stream deck had asked about, uh, was having a way to make icons uh, be able to change layers, and then also possibly trying to make another sort of level of, uh, of organization where you can have multiple layers in a group, uh, or I guess folders maybe is what they call this on the real Stream Deck uh, project. And then you can move between those layers that are within that group, uh, or you could change over to an entirely different group. Um, so like being able to put your layers together and bounce around like that. Um, and then lastly, the other thing I'm going to look at this week is uh, retesting the um, TLC 59711 LED multiplexer. That's the uh, that's the old oldest PR that's out there, and I've tested that a few times. Um, and I've got the circuit all built, put away somewhere. I need to dig it, dig it back out, and uh, try that out again to see if I can get that get that working. The uh, the user working on it said that they tested it with some Adafruit boards and uh, got it going, whereas I could not last time I tried it. So uh, see if I did anything wonky there and try to get that up and running this week. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you. Uh, up next is Hire Effect, and then Hugo will finish things up. Hey, so this past week, uh, I rewrote the internal structure of the alarm module so that things are easier to follow and maintain. Um, uh, those internal changes uh, started with the ESP32 S2, and uh, once kind of the first drafts of uh, the NRF and SCM32 ports are in, uh, I'll hopefully be able to get in there and make similar changes just so that they're all on the same page. Um, basically, that was just making it so that light sleep and deep sleep processes aren't overlapping so much when they don't actually share code. Um, Fixed, I fixed a bug on the ESP32 S2 where the uh, returned alarm objects uh, don't match each other. Um, I got set up with the RP2040 uh, using the JLink so that uh, GDB, I have GDB debugging and um, some basic control tests available as I work on the RP2040 sleep functionality. So I've been starting up on the G RTC and GPIO wake up functions and I'm working on deep sleep for that first. Uh, I also moved back to Boston, which ate up a little bit of time, um, but uh, that's all done now. So this week, I'll just be doing more RP2040 sleep stuff and uh, some other uh, supervisor work that I've been talking about but haven't been able to get to. And that's it for me. All right. Thank you. And in case anybody's wondering, supervisor is a technical term for part of the core C code. It's not uh, telling the other programmers what to do, right? Well, <laughs> sorry. All right, moving on to Hugo to wrap up this section. What's new? All right, so last week I did all the final last changes and tweaks to the progress bars, um, examples. I created a few more and started working on the debranding or branding of the Python build so that each uh, group that builds their own can brand it as appropriate to keep CircuitPython an Adafruit thing. Uh, so this week I will be working on that branding, uh, get a first pass going for review, I'm hoping, and in non-tech or personal stuff, um, getting my second job Wednesday in the morning. So rush hour, long drive, podcast o'clock. All right.
right? Uh, just one that... random connection. Um, Dan had been talking about this patch that went into Mu for recognizing boards based on the USB descriptor. Um, and it's possible that this debranding of CircuitPython would break that, so it might be worth touching base and um, seeing how we can make sure that works best. And Scott, were you going to step in and say something? Yeah, I just wanted to, I, I want to make it clear that my, my goal with this work is not to make it so that the Adafruit-centric one is is called out well. My goal is that like wherever the core CircuitPython repo is that, that we all work on, is what gets the circuit python name i know right now that's like kind of the same thing as adafruit but in the future i i hope it's not so i just want to make it clear that like my goal is that we very clearly support and brand the versions of circuit python that come from kind of the quote unquote official repo and the official ci um but i i, I want to try to make it clear that like i don't assume that that's Ad adafruit only in the long run like it really should be bigger than that Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that's a fine distinction, but a very important one. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully it'll become clearer over time. So thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. All Perfect. right. Well, we already got in the weeds just a little bit there, but now we are officially in the weeds. Um, and the first topic I have has been uh, contributed by Patrick, but uh, they're missing the meeting, so I will be reading it. Um, so it is a potential list of candidate repos to move into the CircuitPython GitHub organization. Um, I'll read these off as they are right now, uh, but people are encouraged to add to the list if you like. We'll finalize this soon after the meeting. Um, so awesome CircuitPython, CircUp, the cookie cutter library repo, the not adafruit.io IoT libraries, uh, which could include Azure IoT, AWS IoT, and GC IoT Core, the community bundle, CircuitPython org, and the we accessories other than the nunchuck, I think is what uh, is being typed right now. <coughs> Pardon me. So, uh, Scott, do you want to say a little bit about this? Because I think you are kind of driving this idea right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really good. I think um, I just need to run these by Phil and Lamar. I just don't want to, I don't want to surprise them when we move things out of the, out from under Adafruit. So I think these are all good ideas. I just think I, I want to double check with them um, about it because you no, know, it, it is a balance between highlighting the things that are Adafruit funded and supported and, and the things that kind of we just put there because they weren't. Um, I think the community bundle is definitely one of the things I highlighted. It's just I want like it's tricky. I want to make sure like some somebody needs to before we move it, we need to make sure that like any instrumentation or other tooling that we have around it can handle it if it's in a different place. Um, so yeah, I think there. Are, I think those are good suggestions. I think um, I'll I'll take an action item, or I'll, I'll I'll take this list and just start an email thread uh, with Phil and Lamore and say like, "Are you okay with this?" Um, and then I can report back next week, or or you'll just see them move over. Um, so yeah, I'm. I think those are all good ideas. I think. Uh, yeah. Awesome circuit Python might have problems just because they it might be linked to from elsewhere. I think that as when well. you transfer a repo from well, at least from a user to an organization, GitHub will forward it until you yeah, work it back into your into your organization or user. So I'm right. not super worried about that, but definitely it's something that you can verify in GitHub documentation right. will work how you want. Yeah. So I got I did get the okay for the circuit or for the community bundle already. So it's just it just needs somebody to make sure that we're not going to break everything if we move it. Yeah, um, the the tooling is almost the biggest. Um, well, I mean, there's the human part and the tooling part. So thanks right. for helping us navigate all of that. Yeah, and I'm 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 happy that people are excited about this. I think I, I'm I'm very excited about it too. It's it's I think a realization that we have stuff that really belongs outside of 
belongs to circuit python more broadly than just adafruit so i think it's good so yeah i'll i'll try to run these by phil and lamar this week just to give them a heads up that these are what these are what we're thinking and then if they have any objections i can i can let folks know all right uh with that i will pass it to hugo for our second in the weeds topic um Hugo, are you ready? There you I go. am sorry, I just lost my place there. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, with the pull request where Jose W helped me out there, um, there is a contributing process in the learn guide for people to contribute to core libraries. So all the Adafruit underscore circuit Python ones. Uh, but there isn't any mention about questing reviewers or assigning reviewers. Um, that's mentioned in the creating and sharing a circuit Python library. Uh, so I don't know if it's because it's in the Adafruit organization or not, but since we can't request review from anyone really, uh, if nobody's watching or kind of getting alerts for these changes, uh, it gets a little difficult to request a review. So I was able to get some because I knew where to ask, but Others may not have quite that knowledge or work with or forthcomingness, I don't know what you want to call it, to ask, where do I do this? So I'm not sure if it's a, a documentation change or something that would just be needed to, hey, if you're going to do this, you know, notify or add a, a notification for someone. Katni, do you want to speak to this at all? So it's, there's a huge section in reviewing in the um, contributing to circuit Python using Git and GitHub guide, which is uh, neither here nor there. It just might explain why it's not in the creating and sharing a library guide. Um, although it was never, it was never, I mean, the, the, this other guide came long after the creating and sharing guide. So it's just was included there. Um, it, the not being able to request a review directly is a is a GitHub limitation. Um, that that's what I'm thinking is um, if you can't ping Circuit Python librarians as a, a team, um, you're you're entirely free to ping me, um, or I don't want to toss out Scott without you know him giving permission, but. Um, I can handle it. There, I figured there's there's uh, there's those of us who are perfectly happy to if you ping us directly to then request review from CircuitPython librarians. Um, so don't feel like don't feel like if you're pinging us directly that we are assuming you mean you need us to review it. Um, like we we understand that you know you, it's not it's that the GitHub limitation exists and that not everybody can request. Um, can request a review. And, and part of that kind of makes sense because if people were able to request reviews, they could start requesting reviews from individuals and that would also go nowhere. Um, it would be about as nowhere as not requesting a review if that individual was unavailable um, or uh, was not, you know, that wasn't their focus at the time. Um, it wouldn't occur to them perhaps to then go and have to say like, hey, I'm not available to review this, blah, blah, blah. Like it just creates extra work. Um, so I can kind of understand why the limitation exists. If you're a reviewer, you can obviously request a review from the from the Adif from the CircuitPython librarians. Um, I would try pinging somebody if if they get it. Like, don't everybody do it? Um, maybe maybe Tim Foamy guy, if you could just on a PR um, try and ping CircuitPython librarians. If it lets you type it out, it'll um, it'll ping. I think. Um, My impression was that that didn't work. But I, I didn't. I feel like it doesn't. Um, but I'm yeah, not I sure. Yeah, I tried doing a mention in a comment like at Circuit Python Librarians, and it didn't even appear as uh, an option. I think it only allowed the individuals who are contributors in that. So I find that sometimes names don't pop up. 
even the weirdly even the author of the pr sometimes doesn't pop up as an option and i've had to go and make sure that i typed it out manually correctly um so that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not pingable but it's definitely a a, a point in in favor of it not being pingable um so what i would say is for now just ping scott or me or both and you can um me. and jeff um and just just ping us and say hey you know would like a review from circuit python librarians and we can get that going and and you can indicate that to other folks as well um, okay and, and you just, mean on the on the issue in github on the pr on the yeah course. okay yeah sorry yeah. No, no, no. Just making sure because issues don't um, don't require reviews. Um, so yeah, on the pull request itself, just ping the three of us, and one of us will uh, make sure that we get a review requested. Because I understand where you're coming from. If if the PR pops in and and the review is not requested, um, for example, it does not show up in my inbox. Um, I have filters set. Um, Anic data, I'm not sure, and that's worth looking into. I will add that to my list for yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, so Anic data writes, it may have been asked, but is there no way to automatically assign CircuitPython librarians as default reviewers on all libraries? And I had a thought kind of adjacent to that with this work um, Scott had done to parse out the, the error messages and automatically add a comment if there was a way to make it take another action if the CI succeeded. So like when you get that green check mark, that the PR passed the continuous integration checks, could it then uh, request circuit Python librarians to review? Because that would be in a way even better. Well, I'm mm -hmm. not sure because sometimes a reviewer needs to step in and say, here's how you get it working. But hopefully with these hints, people are gonna do better. But yeah, if an automatic process could kick this off because ultimately we do want to you know get everything into review regardless of who it's coming from although maybe only if it's passing ci I, I have divided thoughts about that right well the other thing uh david asks um or says usually if i know someone has the hardware i would ping that person the problem with doing that is that um if uh if that person doesn't have time or is unavailable you've now limited other folks would look at that and see that that person was asked for a review and would probably not review the PR um, because they don't want to step on toes or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so it's much better to request from the, from the review team because that's a lot of folks. And that means um, all those folks uh, would be made available. You know, somebody, somebody's probably available to test. Um, and if not, then that's when somebody who has the hardware would have to come forward and so on and so forth. But it's, um, it's not, it's not good. To, I guess it's not good to basically assign somebody, you know, to a specific thing, unless you know, for sure that person is available to test it because other people will probably ignore it. Um, I do like the idea of, um, of the automatic reviewing thing um, because, but I also agree with Jeff that we, there's, there's nuances to it. Like, do we wait until, um, you know, do we wait until um, the CI is passing or how would we even do that and so on and so forth. So I mean, there's a lot to look into um, to see what we can do. But for right now, if you are putting in a PR, um, apparently you can tag CircuitPython librarians. Um, so either tag them in the way that, uh, Foamy Guy did or tag Jeff, Scott, and myself, and we will either way, somebody will get the review requested. I think you can just paste it in. I mean, if you type an at sign name that's not recognized, it doesn't have to autocomplete to turn bold. So. Correct. If it does, yeah, no. Even if it doesn't autocomplete, if you type it out and it is accurate, yeah. it will link and it will work. And I often drag select Circuit Python librarians from somewhere else and then paste it in. So. <laughs> um. Anyway, in the, in the long run, we can 
in the long run, we certainly can't have GitHub actions to it. Yeah. Um, but that's a word that that's a future thing. And this is obviously an immediate issue, right? This is what do we do so, right now? Right now, either ping circuit Python librarians or ping Jeff Scott and I, um, yeah. and one of us, uh, will, will get the re the review requested so we can make sure that no things don't slip. So that we can track this idea of automatically adding CircuitPython circuit Python librarians as a reviewer so that we don't lose track of it, where would it be good for Hugo to file an issue? Uh, oh, with how to handle this? For Yeah, for like adding some kind of automatic thing. Uh, CircuitPython, and I'll label it libraries. Okay. Um or uh, that's fine. I mean, it doesn't. If we get it somewhere, we can, there, like we track it, that's better than not having. Yeah, it. we we can we can move it if we need to. Yeah. So Hugo, are you willing to write up something for an issue in the Circuit Python um, Git repo? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, next, we have a topic from Jose David and Dan and. Um, Jose David, is text only. Dan, do you want to introduce this issue or shall I? Uh, I, I think I can summarize it. Okay, please do. So um, it just Jose David was adding a bunch of new examples and uh, found, I, I asked when I was, because I was reviewing one of them, uh, a lot of the examples in simple test right now for sensors use that I2C sensors use bus io.i2c and then they specifies the scl and sda pins explicitly and so the simple test examples and or the examples that jose david was writing uh, could use board.i2c instead of bus io the bus io call and so the question was did we have any guidance on in simple test and or other exa simple examples whether we should use board or bus IO, and I was I asked Katni that question. Um, yeah, we we've, we've been leaning towards board.icc. So so I think Jose is saying in the long run, then we can go ahead and gradually change the simple test examples in the libraries to be board. And I suggested um, adding like a comment that says like this uses board.scl and board.sda just so people know what's going on it's for beginners you can just add a simple comment and but i and we can gradually cut it over i mean jose, jose is saying we could do this i don't think we have to do it it's not an urgent thing in any way so but just when you write a new simple test or when you write an example use board.i2c if you can if it makes sense. So that's really what this is about. Um, a related thing that came up while we were discussing this is that um, on some boards that have a stemma connector, board that I2C is the same as the stemma connector because uh, there aren't enough I2C pins to make a separate I2C bus. However, on the QDPI RP2040, the stemma connector is different than the labeled SCL and SDA pins. It's SCL1 and SDA1. So an interesting question is whether we might add a board object that refers to the stemma connector on those boards. I think yes. And Scott, does that sound interesting to you? Yeah, I think I think you should have a stemma I2C entry for anything with a stemma on it, even if it's shared with the regular yeah, I2C. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. That's um, a good and idea. just link it to the same thing. Right, and it should be it should be stemma stemma QT. I'll I'll, and I'll ask management about the exact <laughs> name because it could be stemma QT or stemma just stemma. You may want to choose one or the other. Yeah, just okay. yeah, just be consistent. Yeah. I don't right, think we great. can make it work if it needs to be stemma divided by QT. That'll be trouble. That will be trouble. 
yeah, we have to implement a special version of slash operator. Okay. Yeah, David David G points out there is big stemma too, but I, I think in general we're not using big stemma. And it can also mean other things like uh, NeoPixels for those as well. Yeah, yeah. Pygamer and PyPortal have the big one. They do. It's also wired as five volts by default with a jumper to switch it. It's a little bit of a pain to use those kind of with modern Stemma QT boards, mm -hmm. which I discover each time I try. We have an adapter cable. I think it wasn't in stock that day. You know how Stemma <laughs> cables are. Right. All right. Um, there, and there's one other kind of sub item, but I think that's asked and answered within the notes document. So I will skip I... over it. OK. Unless you'd like to say something about it, Katni? Um, no, just, I guess, um, for people who are listening later, um, there's in the library infrastructure issues on circuitpython.org slash contributing uh, section for mismatched read the docs.yaml. And this uh, is currently triggering on everything. Um, it's not something that needs to be solved. The check itself has been changed in Adabot, but we never updated it on circuitpython.org. We didn't update the Adabot submodule. So I will get that taken care of tomorrow. Um, the PR is here that fixed it. Um, and that is how uh, it got resolved. So that was all. All right. Um, with that, uh, it looks like the next topic is Foamy Guys. All right. Um, yeah, this was, I think, will be relatively easy. But basically, it's just um, I started making the repos in the CircuitPython org uh, over the weekend and pushing those widgets from the old, uh, they're in the display layout library today. Um, I started pushing those in. And as part of the process, I made the, uh, the first release on one to see what would happen. And um, the, the PyPy upload failed, which I, th I think is probably expected because it didn't have any um, credentials in the secrets or whatever they call that inside GitHub where you put those. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is basically in the repos in that circuit Python org, which accounts are those going to use for read the docs and PyPy? And then uh, can somebody with access to that put them in? Or, or is that the kind of thing where like we should be making new ones for that? Um, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think new accounts are the right way to go. Um, maybe what we do is we just put those in a private repo under the org as a way to for us to kind of like share credentials for it. I think generally it's good to have one account that has access to it all that like you don't actually use. You add your yet you add your personal account as a maintainer as well, but you always like the the. I'll read the docs. For read the doc, yeah. For read the docs and I guess PyPI. Well, PyPI you can have multiple as well if you want. Maintainers, to. okay. Uh, we did think... um, global secrets for PyPI True. on the Adafruit org. Um, it would be simpler, I think, to I mean, we can create a new account. That's not an issue. Yep. But I think having global secrets on the CircuitPython org um, makes yep. sense as well. And for read the docs, we can create a single account. Then you. Um, Homey guy, for example, would create the project on read the docs and then add, you know, circuit Python account as a maintainer. And then what that means is that if you, um, stopped working with us, for example, mm -hmm. uh, we would still have access to those, uh, documents, um, and would be able to change them. And so that way it's not limited, but we can, um, figure out a place to keep, um, the credentials for read the docs, but you don't actually need the read the docs credentials for that account to add it as a maintainer. That's how we do it. We have an Adabot account. I got you. Um, and we just like, I go and create the project under my name and then I add Adabot as a maintainer. Okay. And that that's how we sort of, that's how we tie things together um, right now. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think, I think, um, I think I understand that. I can handle that, make those on read the docs and then share them over. Um, so then, uh, uh, Scott, do you want to create a, a PyPy account or is that something you would want me or somebody else to do? You're welcome to, do you have organizational secrets access? Maybe not. Mm, 
That's a good question. Um, uh, so I could I could set the I could I could make it too. Okay. If, if you just need an account, um, just tell me what you need me to do, and I'll do it. I can create okay. it. Yeah, Katni, you can do it too. Although I didn't. I don't think. Katni, did you get org level ownership? Oh yeah, I did as soon as it was created. Okay, cool. I'm, I think I'm an owner on it. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I do. I don't see a settings gear in the spot where I think it would be. But I've never actually used an org like this before either, so I don't know if I'm looking in the right spot. But yeah, if one of you. Um, yeah, I added one most of... folks as just members. Uh, because then I can I, I was able to turn off the ability to make private repos because that's where you can like incur costs because the org you. is actually set up to like charge Adafruit. <laughs> I see. Um, so I was like, oh, let me at least set the permission so that like, yeah, you can make repos all you want, but you can't actually make any private ones. Private ones. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, if if one of you could could spin that up, and then if there's anything that I can do to help um, with my access, I'm definitely willing to do that. Otherwise, if you let me know once that's uh, in there, I can try to tie it together with the existing. I put in two of the repos over the weekend, uh, so I can try and get those yeah, two awesome. set up with that stuff. Nice. Yeah, Katni, I just gave you ownership, so you can do it. Okay. Um, what email address do we want to use? Because CircuitPython at Adafruit.com is already being used. Oh, for the account? Um, usually you can cheat it and add pluses <laughs> in, if you do like something, something plus like PyPI circuitpython.org at whatever, like it all goes to the same place. Okay. Um, that's what, like, that's what I did for at least one of the accounts where it like goes to our, our internal embedded mailing list. Uh, okay. With a plus. So try that. And if you can't figure it out, I'm happy to do it as well. All right. So the action item goes to Katni. Thank you for taking care of that. Uh, and with that, I will pass things to Simon C. Uh, Simon, are you planning to speak or would you like me to read this for you? Hello? Hello, your audio level is a little low, so please turn it up if you can. Okay, is that any better? Yeah, that's somewhat better. Okay, so um, I'm very new to uh, CircuitPython and the kind of Adafruit uh, Discord community. It's been a really great, I think it's been less than, than a week. Um, so I uh was looking at a comment that Katni posted about um, the animations library growing in size and getting uh, too big for uh, being fully loaded onto smaller boards. And uh, so I suggested some uh, kind of techniques for having uh, a program look at the library and try to kind of cut out stuff that isn't isn't used. Uh, and so this is uh, kind of a very uh, old technique from, I think they figured it out pretty well in the 70s and 80s in uh, analysis research. And uh, it definitely has some use in JavaScript for uh, kind of um, optimizing uh, kind of code shipping and code execution over the web. And I think Python, it doesn't have too much um, use in this kind of um, uh, automatic way. It's more uh, like an inspection tool where you can, can look at how your how your code's doing with something like Nose, or I think there's a tool, Vulture, that you can kind of look at the output. And so I kind of suggested a couple um, uh, ways to uh, organize, like almost like sub slices or sub parts of libraries that you could. Um, uh, select to use um, and, and put onto uh, to the board. Um, and I was curious about what uh, different, like, you know, how it should be, the API should be like, and kind of what is best for letting users do this or having Adafruit package these kind of sub subparts of libraries. And I, there's plenty I don't know about how CircuitPython is built. 
and kind of what the, the language limitations are. Uh, I think there's one particular uh, limitation on uh, static. The kind of analysis has to be static, and any changes to uh, within Python, uh, like if you if you say import module, um, that can be static analyzed. But if you uh, import uh, kind of doing import dynamically, it doesn't. It's hard to uh, pick up that uh, that type of um, uh, that pattern. And so I'm kind of wondering about language limitations and kind of what people think a good API would be. All right. Well, thank you and welcome. It's nice to see you join us. Um, does anybody have anything they'd like to say about that? I, I know I call on you, Scott, because you think deeply about lots of things. <laughs> right. Uh, I try. Um... I think it's really interesting. I know like the thing that I, I think the data flow stuff is really interesting. I can see like Python is very dynamic, which can make it difficult. Um, but I think there's only a few libraries where our imports are actually like kind of as needed. Um, generally for like how to split things apart, it's just like, you know, all the related things should be in a file uh, because file is like the level that you import stuff into RAM. Um, kind of my my desired next step in terms of making libraries like less large is just actually instrumenting it. Um, like I think we would be much better about keeping our libraries small if we simply knew how much bigger we were making them as we change them. Um, and that's like that's not related to this. I don't want to like answer with a different thing, but uh, I think in terms of like us maintaining the libraries on the whole, that that would be a, a better first step is just to instrument it and track how large they're getting. Um, but I could see that I could see that data flow analysis would be really helpful for specific libraries that that may need to be restructured to be more efficient. Uh, but I've not actually done any data flow analysis myself, so I can't really say how feasible it is with Python. I, I would say there's not that much dead code or something like that. I mean, it's really that the libraries are large because they have a lot of features, like some sensor, or or they have multiple things in them, like the animation library. So um, I'm not sure you're going to find out a lot um, that would help you shrink them significantly. As Scott said, it makes sense just to make smaller libraries to be and, and factor them into multiple things. Like, should we break up the animation library? So the HID library, you know, that kind of thing. Another thing that occurs to me is we're very um, proud of this trait in CircuitPython where to change your program, you just edit code.py. You don't uh, run a series of tools or anything. And uh, taking the animation library as the example, you know, it would be possible that your tool could statically figure out that code.py doesn't use a particular one of the animations and eliminates it from the CircuitPy drive. But then when you edit your code.py, and save it, that can change. And in the vast majority of cases, we want to keep this workflow where the only thing you need is a text editor, not a static analysis package that would run over your code.py plus all of the libraries that it calls for. I think, yeah, the extension of that is like, you know, thinking about ways of modifying we've been talking about like circuit python builds that you know have this kind of dynamic addition and subtraction of modules i mean that could feasibly apply to libraries too where you kind of like specify what parts of the libraries you want available in this particular circuit python build but it's definitely part of just kind of scott's general philosophy and concern that whenever you reduce something you know it becomes a support issue basically so Um, size reductions, that kind of dynamic size reduction where you actually build size reductions into like a build of CircuitPython, it kind of makes it not CircuitPython anymore, um, which, uh, which is complicating. 
Uh, sure. Uh, there is one kind of tweak on the kind of typical data, the uh, kind of code elimination pattern where you're reducing everything you don't use, where you are more saying what uh, you're kind of adding a dependency on a, a kind of, I, I was calling it a label, like a sub part of the library. And there's what your code actually uses. Uh, and then there's what the sub part of the library that that label, it says, this is all, these are all the entry points that I need to use this library successfully. So it kind of, uh, it's, you know, it's a little bit different than, uh, this kind of pattern is maybe a kind of a combination of both. This is kind of a, uh, this is what your goal is. And it kind of ignores specifically what the, the importing code is doing. So I'm just trying to get at kind of the heart of this thing. I mean, your objective here would be to use labels to outline the parts of the libraries that you need in order to reduce size of a specific CircuitPython build. Is that is that right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, and and this only is relevant if there is a library that's one library that's big and somebody wants to only use a part of it. I think, I think the, yeah, the, the tricky part is just doing custom circuit Python builds is like a complicated thing. Go, you go, Scott. I, th I think this sort of analysis could be a really good way of understanding like the the mismatch between how the library is structured and how it's used, right? Like the principle of that I've tried to push from the get-go with circuit Python is that we should have lots of small libraries where, whatever's in the library is like very tightly related and so you're probably using most of it right but i think what we found is that we have some large large libraries where they try to do everything which means that they have a lot of stuff that you're importing that you're not using um so i think doing data flow analysis where like one thing we do have is like we have a lot of examples right like we can do something similar like project bundle where we do data flow analysis starting from all these different examples and then using that kind of to figure out like what the boundaries are for large libraries that we actually need to split. Um, and then you would manually split them later, right? But you would use the data flow analysis to inform like where those split boundaries could could be. Also so not like doing it in a bespoke way. Go ahead, Lucian. Right, just like not doing it in a bespoke way where you're doing it for every single, for, for a, a specific build for a specific person, but just using it to plan right. out actual library separations. Right. Right. Yeah, you'd identify like clusters using right. data flow analysis, but then it's a human action to to perform the useful split. Right. I think that sounds really cool. Is that what you're saying, Simon? Uh, yeah, I think the kind of very precise definition of a label. So I, I think you're, you're right that the typical trend is that data flow and code elimination cut out everything that's not used in the build. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, let's say there's a, a, a setup function that a user needs. So let's say you do that you know, custom for every time you run something on a board. Uh, so let's say there's some custom setup function that somebody should have called, but they, but they didn't. And so that setup function is eliminated, and then they you know, change the code.py to add it, and then it's not there. So right. that, that's kind of how it should differ from the typical compile kind of dead code elimination. Uh, yeah, I think the very precise pattern I was interested in is uh, you know, a label is a sub part of the library that contains all of the entry points that you need to use that label successfully. Um, hmm. So I think that would kind of be like a human created front end to uh, a valid uh, dead code eliminated subpart. Um, hmm. um, but there, there are existing tools for just looking at what what a use doesn't doesn't use. So that's, I think Vulture right. does that uh, reasonably well. And so does, I think, knows. Hmm. I think, I think just the broader, the separation that, that would, that has to be kind of acknowledged is, is whether 
the user or whether a dev is doing this separation. I think that that's just uh, still what I don't totally get, whether which side you're describing. Uh, I was giving that open as something I didn't know enough about, I think because I don't know what tools are used to build CircuitPython. And I didn't, I, I know the, the CircuitPython tool would have to come a long way to, to support that. I think that, yeah, I think generally right now we, like, the broadest thing is just, like, when we import a module, it's like a file level thing, right? So so if we, we think about memory impacts of libraries, it's whatever a the, the contents of a file are plus anything that they import as well is kind of like the units that, that they're done. Um, and so that's why my bias is like, let's change these units so they better align with use. Uh, but there are some things that we could potentially do that would be like lazy loading code in CircuitPython so that like, like we have a, like we have more flash than we have RAM generally. So like we could think about if it's an MPY file, like maybe when we first parse it, we don't actually like load the code in. We just say where it is in the file. And then only when we actually would, would have called it, we load it in. Um, but I think the reality is, is that like, we're very much in uh, like Moore's law territory for microcontrollers right now. So like it, it's not usually that useful <laughs> to optimize libraries because we're going to get hardware that is let is as it as inexpensive as what we're using now but has much more ram and flash so yeah actually now so yeah i realized i was hung up on the idea of circuit python builds this wouldn't be if you did a fully bespoke solution it would be something that would be like built into circ up where you load the libraries in the file and basically circ up checks the libraries and edits parts out depending on what's in your code.py file as you load, as you like save your code.py, it would go in and do library editing to reduce size. And it would have the full libraries on the host computer end. It wouldn't it would reduce them on the circuit Python end? Um, I, at least that's 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 what I think you'd have to do if you wanted to do a disbus rope solution as opposed to a long term planning thing. Right. Um, I'm not sure how. Yeah, I'm like like Scott said, it's like, it's, it's a lot of work for not so many boards anymore. And it's going to be less boards every year. That's that are going to have those problems. Maybe. Okay. So it sounds like it's more, I'm just, you know, there might be a couple of libraries that we want to do this for, but it sounds less, um, less useful. I think it's a matter of how it is applied. It's definitely an interesting idea. Well, yeah, I think we aren't really familiar with applying these kinds of, of ideas. I mean, I recognize the, the name tree shaking as it applies to JavaScript, but uh, it's not a level of, of abstraction or, or technology that I think about CircuitPython with, so. Does I mean, I can kind of see the I, outline I of it, the circuit feature, but okay. yeah. I mean, if the good. VM did it, it would be amazing, right? Like, if it if the VM has to run less code, then that's cool. But um, like Python in general, like even C Python doesn't do a whole lot of optimization on my code at runtime. Um, and there's been some discussion in the C Python world about like whether they do want to go the route of like V8, where they're doing very aggressive optimizations, or whether C Python is really there to be like a canonical, like less optimized but canonical implementation of Python. So, I think whatever you're interested in, <laughs> we're open to. Yeah, for instance, uh, okay. if it's a source to source transformation program that can can live and show its promise uh you know wherever it comes from which is how circup got started i think basically um and now i depend on it um so you know if this interests you you should absolutely work on it and it might 
might find more of a place than some of us are imagining right off the bat because we're not imaginative enough. Um, another random thing I wanted to interject is I was looking at the size of MPY files, which are the CircuitPython byte compiled version of Python files. And when strings are repeated many times, like in a main in the main level, and then I think down in functions, the strings are repeated in the MPY file. And that seems like some really low hanging fruit for saving um, storage I, size of MPY files, if that observation I, is correct. I think they may have changed that mm -hmm. upstream already. Okay, so maybe if we so get for any MPY 15, stuff. Yeah, hold your horses on any optimizations to stuff that MicroPython may have done already. Because yeah. I know there is a new MPY version with what will merge in. So, yeah. And like, how, how high priority is, is like the size? Is the size of a library file that you load onto the file system? Like, is that usually a big concern? Because we usually have a lot of file system flash. No, I for, think, for I think the it's the non express M zeros is the only place that really matters. And that's true. Those duplicated strings will be merged into one string in memory when it imports. Uh, it sounded like there was one specific library, like the animations library that Katni was, was talking about. Can somebody kind of speak to that, that issue, or is that? I mean, the ones I'm aware of are like more of the PyPortal-esque ones, like this class of libraries that tried to do like all the inst all of the initialization for you, uh, for example, can be quite large. The animations library became far more popular than I think I expected it would. Um, and so we were taking anybody who added animations um we were just adding them and i think i think that's Ooh. a problem um i want to refactor out the community submitted ones to another cuz they're not they're 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 not used as as significantly as some of the other ones um into their own library um are they in different files or is it is it a ram problem or a flash problem uh they're all in different files like okay, every so animation a, is in a separate so it is file. A, it is a flash problem then. Yeah, you could you, you can very easily drag part of the library over, but that's like that's a support nightmare. Right. We're not gonna we're not gonna tell people to do that. Um, right. Okay. I mean, we can tell people to do that on Discord, but we're not gonna write a learn guide on doing it. Um, yeah, and Bundlefly isn't gonna do it. No, Bundlefly is not gonna do it either. So, um, basically, I I want to slim it down to be able to, for example, as this was, as Naradoc pointed out, run on NeoTrinky, that's what brought this up in the first place, mm -hmm. um, was that Lamor was like, yeah, I do LED animations. And I said, it doesn't fit. And she said, sure, it does. And I said, no, it really <laughs> doesn't. And she's like, maybe I dragged, she, she doesn't, she, she, she might have just dragged stuff over and not realized it. Right. Um, so uh, that one, I think, is going to be addressed specifically. And I think it needs to be because it is a very ridiculously popular library and we do have tiny boards that folks want to run leds from yeah um so i think that's a that's a good candidate for a refactor i don't think that applies to everything though right and by refactor you actually mean splitting apart into separate correct like, yes repos. i mean yeah where yeah where some of the animations are actually separate they would still require the circuit python led animations library um I'm not going to duplicate code, but right. it would um, build on. It top would, in of theory, that. yeah, it would build on top of it, and it would create a situation in theory where we can fit this onto a smaller board, and then right. just like a few other libraries where we have to be very careful with what we add, um, we would have to be very mindful of what mm -hmm. we add to the CircuitPython LED animation library as well. If the if the core and I, I use an overloaded word, if the if the very minimal part could fit in. Uh, frozen on some of these devices, but that's probably too much to hope for since not. Well, I think I think that's the problem. I think Lamore might have tried that. Mm. Well, um, I know that the but, um, like, Pixel Buff doesn't fit, so it's about right. Space, so. Well, yeah, and already on Neo Trinky, Neo Pixel um, is 
NeoPixel is frozen, HID is frozen, and um, pixel buff is enabled. So PyPixel buff is not necessary. Okay. Right. So basically, I think she created the, the best version of the build she possibly could. And we have to make the library smaller if we want to use it. This, this may change with the updated MicroPython as well. Cool. Then I will it, hold off on that for a week. It, because like when you freeze libraries in, you're basically freezing in the MPY files. Right. Uh, the same similar structures. So. Yeah, that'll change, hopefully for the better. <laughs> That could be a pretty big ro roadblock to getting to 115 if everything gets larger. Yeah. Well, uh, shall we wrap this discussion up? Uh, sure. It sounds like there's kind of two uses. There's uh, slim down what is being used, and then I think that I want to use this sub part of a library and then give me that slim down build is the maybe more usable one that I was, was thinking about. So that's, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep reading and thinking about it. That's all. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Simon. Hope to see more from you in the future. And we're happy to help you, you know, get up to speed on some things about how the core works. Um, there is a lot to know. And even those of us who've been doing it for a while are still learning. So really appreciate you joining us and bringing a different perspective and hope to see you again soon. And that will allow us to wrap up the CircuitPython weekly meeting. This has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for April 19th, 2021. And I'll just click back over to my um, other document for the wrap up. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on it, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast in audio-only version will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held next Monday as usual at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. That will be the April uh, 26th meeting, if I'm not mistaken. The meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the Circuit Pythonista's role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks all.